Hello everyone and welcome to The Wild Side. This is your host, Dr. Caitlin Kite. And that was she and him singing Change is Hard. And this week I want to talk about change, as you might have guessed after hearing that song. And I want to talk about climate change. Uh, I've been wanting to talk about climate change for a little while on the show, but I think I wanted to take it somewhere a bit different than what we typically find in the media. Because there's a lot of coverage kind of arguing whether climate change is really happening, um, you know, are we f experiencing climate change here? And then there's a lot of coverage of the people who are fighting about whether or not it's happening. And there's also even some disagreement over, okay, let's, let's assume we all agree it is happening. What are we going to see as climate change occurs? And so I kind of want to get away from all of those arguments and all of that back and forth debate uh, because I think the evidence now is pretty clear that climate change is happening and that humans have been uh, a pretty big cause of it, although there may also be some natural fluctuation anyway. So I want to just start with the assumption that yes, this is a thing that's happening. We are currently experiencing some changes. We will continue to see some changes over the next several decades. And I've kind of talked about some of those issues a bit tangentially already on previous episodes of the show. So starting with that basic information, I want to just think about what are the effects that we're going to see uh, as, climate, as the climate continues to change over the next decades or, or even centuries. Now obviously we won't be around to see some of those further changes, but there are things that we're beginning to see emerge from studies. We can kind of project these patterns and get an idea of what's going to happen to humans, to wildlife, to uh, the whole ecosystem around us. And what I've done is I've looked this week at some of the most recent research that's come out uh, in the scientific journals, and I've collected together a bunch of the newest evidence about the patterns that are going to continue to happen and some of these alterations that we might be observing over the next several decades. And I just want to walk you through each of these different studies and kind of think about the variety of changes that we might see as the climate continues to shift. Now the first thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about is some research on bison in North America. And this research suggests that we might over time begin to see changes in the size of these organisms uh, and directly linked to the kind of habitat that they're finding themselves in and the temperatures and the other climate conditions. And this is something that's not just interesting in terms of bison, but it probably is something that suggests a broader pattern that we might see in lots of other different species uh, some of them related species like cattle, and you can imagine if we're going to have impacts of climate on cattle, then that could be very important to humans since we do uh, rely on these so much for milk and for meat and for other leather products and things like that. But also even more uh, distantly related things, you know, for example, even amphibians or reptiles or any of these things that might experience similar shifts, that could go on and have broader repercussions for the whole ecosystem. So it's worth thinking about these results and pondering how they might uh, impact us in the future. So this particular study was performed by a researcher who was looking at 22 different bison herds throughout the U.S. And these were predominantly located in the prairie areas that kind of stretch from um, the Mississippi west to the Rocky Mountain Range. And there were bison herds all over this area, so he was able to look at some that were quite a bit to the east, some that were quite a bit to the west, others that were quite far to the north, so for example up in the Dakotas, and others that were more southerly. So even though these were all sharing the same general kind of habitat, they had very different climatic con uh, conditions and kind of weather patterns throughout the year. And all of these herds are studied by the government and they're kind of taken care of by the government because there has been a lot of work to bring them back from the brink. So there's quite a lot of investment in monitoring these animals and taking care of them. So there's a lot of information that researchers have collected over the years about the weights and the ages and the sexes of all the organisms within these herds. So you could take all of that specific information about the demographics and compare that to climate variables that had been measured at each of those sites where the herds were living. And the results found that the, the bison tend to be smaller in size, so the overall kind of, you know, the size of their frame, but also they tended to be uh, less weighty in areas where the temperatures were higher. So in areas where it's hotter, you have smaller organisms. And this is something that you can see 
Uh, for example, if you take out just a couple of, of sites and look at the two extremes, so if you look at the coolest and wettest areas where the bison are living, and also the warmest uh, and driest areas where the bison are living, you can really see a difference in those two extremes. So for example, uh, among males living in South Dakota, if you look at an average seven-year-old male, the researcher found that these guys were about 1,900 pounds. But if you look down in Oklahoma, he found that these were about 1,300 pounds. And these warmer areas, this, so that would be Oklahoma, which is further south, and it's, it's going to be a lot warmer than South Dakota is on average throughout the year, is about 600 pounds lighter. So that is quite a significant difference. And this difference is associated with about a 20 degree temperature difference as well. So that's quite an extreme shift in temperature, and that's not the kind of extreme shift that we expect around the world as climate change continues, uh, but it still is a, a quite a telling pattern. So let's just say that these things can be related on a one-to-one -one basis. If we expect uh, a three degree change in terms of, or, or three to six degree change uh, in the, the average temperature of the globe as the climate continues to alter, then, um, you know, that 600 pounds, let's divide it by three. So that's maybe something like a couple hundred pounds for an animal like a bison or a, a cow that might change as a result of that expected alteration in the Earth's temperature. And even 200 pounds is nothing uh, to sniff at. That's still quite a significant difference in weight. And this is a, a shrinking trend that possibly could be widely seen in response to climate change, as I mentioned before, not just uh, in these grassland areas, not just with cattle, but for other ecosystems as well, potentially, and also other organisms. And in the grassland area, this seems to be driven by the fact that in warm grasslands, you have grasses that have less protein. And this is uh, probably associated with the fact that they're just under different growing conditions. They have to hurry up and breed as soon as they can in these cooler areas um, versus in the warmer areas. And so they lay down different amounts of proteins and they, they, they use their nutrients differently because some of them can store it away and some of them have to use them immediately. And so these differences in reproductive constraints on the plants result in differences in how many nutrients are then available in those plants for organisms like bison to eat and ingest and, and, and use for their own growth. So this could have serious economic implication, uh, implications for those involved with bison herds and also cultural implications because these are quite important uh, to Native American tribes in the region, to people that maybe are involved in, in ranching and want to have that lifestyle or who bring people in to kind of see what a ranch is like and who are interested in ecotourism. So this could have lots of impacts. And it, as I mentioned earlier, it could affect ranchers that are working with other grazers as well. So just like bison, you've got cattle with the kind of similar physiological parameters and, and needing a lot of protein in order to grow. So any organism that's going to be protein limited could be really restricted in these areas where um, that changing temperature is going to change how much protein the, the plants are putting into their, their leaves and the other bits of them that would be eaten by animals. And in fact, Researchers have estimated that approximately $1 billion, American dollars, could be lost per year with each 1.5 degree increase in temperature. And that's you know, quite significant on a per year basis and also over time if you accumulate all that stuff and calculate up. That would be quite a lot of money lost. And that's with just 1.5 degrees. So if we do have something like 3 degrees or even 6 degrees in some areas, that $1 billion could actually be quite a lot bigger. And that would either be because you've got smaller cattle, um, for example, that would result in reduced income because you can't sell them as much if they don't have as much meat. Or it could be something like the, uh, the ranchers have to invest in protein supplements or other kind of alternative methods in order to get the cattle to that same size that they are today. And you know, not just to focus in on the potential implications for farmers and for ranchers, but there are also potential ecological implications of this because grazers like bison and like cattle uh, are really important to the ecosystem because they make water available, they help make light available because they, they nibble down plants and so they open up the habitat a bit. They're responsible for eating those nutrients in the plants and then putting them back out into the environment uh, as they leave behind their waste products and that's really important for acting as a fertilizer. And so in general they tend to make the areas in which they live more productive they allow greater diversity 
Uh, they tend to make plants healthier because plants have evolved to respond well to being grazed. This, they, you know, they have lived among grazers for a m really long period of time, uh, evolutionarily and geologically, and so you've got these millions of years of close interaction between these organisms, and if you suddenly remove one of them or make it less effective, then it is going to alter the balance a lot. And so this is quite uh, a significant thing that we have to think about, perhaps, with these organisms changing in size and changing in ecosystem function. And that was Ingrid Michelson with Spare Change. And just before the break, I was talking about the first of several pieces of news I want to discuss about the effects of climate change. And I was talking a little bit about bison, and now I want to go from that really large organism to something amazingly small. And I want to think about the effects of changing ocean temperatures on species like zooplankton and other microscopic organisms living in the ocean. So we already know that changes in the ocean environment are having a, a serious impact on organisms because of the changes in temperatures, uh, the changes in nutrient flow because of that, acidification, changes in oxygen levels, all sorts of, of effects that are either direct or indirect and they're associated with these changes to the, the larger global climate. And one thing that we know is that over the past several decades the area on the, the northeastern continental shelf of, of the U.S. has experienced kind of a general increase in temperature. Now some areas are a bit smaller and uh, a bit smaller, a bit cooler, and some are a bit warmer, but in general if you average across that whole region there is um, a, a general increase in the temperature. And this is because the warmest areas have become more common. So whatever that warmest temperature was that you would have found several decades ago, you now see that temperature in a lot more places. Uh, amongst the coldest areas, you see that happening, at, you know, that temperature is coming up about as often, or maybe there are a few more places that are that temperature. But then what you really find that's driving this pattern is that the intermediate areas have declined. And so those intermediate areas are making way for more of these really warm areas. And this is a real problem because it was these moderate regions of this whole habitat that were considered to be kind of the core habitats of, of that whole shelf area. So you don't have a whole lot of organisms that are great with the really cold or the really hot. You've got a bunch that need to go to that intermediate area where it's not too stressful in either direction and they can live in a nice, happy, kind of moderate climate. And so when you, when you don't have these areas, that can have a big impact on what the species are doing in that area, where they're found, are they migrating elsewhere, and how are they interacting with each other. And really this whole change has resulted from the fact that uh, alterations in the weather of the globe have caused changes in the circulation of something called the Labrador Current. And that has happened throughout the entire northern Gulf of Maine. And so it's not just this northeastern continental shelf, it's actually this whole big patch of ocean that's experiencing these changes. And temperature is something that's really important kind of fundamentally because it impacts how fast you can grow, whether you can grow at all, uh, whether you can reproduce, whether you're going to live um, high up in the water or lower down in the water because obviously the farther away you are from the surface the colder it is. So if all the water is colder then you're going to have to be even closer to the surface and those uh, deeper bits are going to be even more inaccessible because they'll, they'll become even colder. And it'll also kind of affect your lateral arrangement, so you're going to maybe try to go to those warmer areas that are a bit more comfortable for you. And indeed, we do see that because of all these constraints on whether or not these habitats are, are um, conducive to certain morphologies and physiologies, you do have a lot of animals that are moving laterally. So they're either appearing in new habitats that are a bit more comfortable for them, or they're disappearing locally uh, because that it's just not comfortable at all and they can't find a new spot and so they kind of go locally extinct. And you also have others that may change the depth at which they live. And all of this is going to impact then the trophic interactions or the interactions at the different levels, if you like, of the food web. So if you have species that are a prey species or a predator species and suddenly they're gone or suddenly they show up in a new place, that's really going to impact 
whether or not there are other animals there that can eat them or that are going to be eaten by them. And that will change the whole population structure of those species involved in those food web interactions. So zooplankton are really important because they're kind of considered a basal species in trophic interactions. And so they can influence lots of other organisms. And I think I actually mentioned these last week that they, they are really fundamental. They are um, part of that group of organisms that are responsible for doing a lot of, uh, for turning over a lot of the nutrients and allowing nutrient flow within ecosystems. So they're extremely important. They are quite abundant, uh, normally speaking. And they're particularly important for young fish and marine mammals. So things will, will eat these little tiny things in, in really big numbers, because they are quite small. So you have to filter feed bunches of them in order to get them out and have enough nutrition. And when the zooplankton levels fall, then you've got these other larger organisms that are going to have trouble finding adequate resources for whatever they need to do. And one of the species that's particularly dependent on zooplankton in this area, this northeastern continental shelf, is the Atlantic cod. And we know a little bit about Atlantic cod over here because there has been an issue with overfishing, and that has been the same problem in um, in the U.S. as well, you had cod that were very popular fish and their populations plummeted because they were just fished too much. And now they're in the midst of a rebound after all of that population disruption. And actually the rebound was going quite well until all of these climate effects started to, to be known. And it turns out that actually there are some areas in which zooplankton are changing their numbers and this could be impacting how well the cod are doing and whether the rebound is actually going to, to come to be. So this particular study that I was reading about over the weekend looked at two particular zooplankton species that were very important to cod. And one of them was eaten by winter spawning cod and the other was eaten by spring spawning cod. So really these are two species of zooplankton that kind of cover the range of what's going to be important in that ocean environment to these cod species. And what they found, these researchers, were that there were places where the zooplankton had declined because of the changing temperatures in the ocean. And in those same places, you found, they, they found that cod were less abundant. And so there seemed to be this direct correlation where you've got uh, less zooplankton and therefore also less cod. And these are the same places as well where the temperature changes have been measured. So it's not just kind of this guess that, oh, maybe the temperature changed and so the zooplankton left and now the cod aren't doing so well. All three of these things have been measured in exactly the same spots. And so there's pretty strong evidence that it is these environmental fluctuations that are hampering the zooplankton and then that lack of food is then hampering the cod. And this is obviously quite an important thing if you want to bring back species like the cod from the brink uh, of extinction. And you know, it's not an easy question to solve either because you can't exactly go into the ocean and, you know, warm it back up or cool it back down or make these nice intermediate spots and so bring back the zooplankton and therefore help the cod. This is kind of something that has happened and will continue to happen and it's a little bit out of our hands except maybe to, you know, make sure it doesn't happen too quickly or, or to too great of an extent. So what the researchers of this study were particularly interested in emphasizing uh, given their results, was that there are these really complex dynamics that are associated with conservation efforts. And so you might really focus in on a threatened species like the cod, but then forget to think about the other species that it interacts with, and also uh, how that environment in which they live are going to impact, uh, is going to impact those species, but also the conservation species as well. So it's a, a lot of variables that you have to keep in mind and you have to understand how all of these things are associating with each other and affecting each other in order to make good decisions and good management plans. So maybe there's going to be some way to, you know, preferentially protect these areas that are right now really rich in zooplankton and good for the cod. And maybe there's going to be a way to add some other kind of supplementation or make sure that they aren't fishing out some other source of food in these same areas that cod could use instead of the zooplankton. So you have to begin to think of kind of some alternative methods for management in order to counter the effect of that climate change in these areas. And the researchers also think that potentially we could take this kind of information and use it to predict what will happen in the future 
as marine temperatures continue to change. So for example, if we know that certain species are sensitive to certain temperatures, and we can project how those species are going to react as the climate continues to change, and then we can think about, right, how are their predators going to react to that if, if we see these changes? Or how will their prey react to that if these species are suddenly really abundant or, or much less abundant than they used to be? So we can think about these complex uh, interactions not just after they've happened and become, become, a, become a challenge for us, but we can also use that knowledge of those interactions to kind of make preparations for the future and maybe stop some some bad things from happening before we actually get to that point. So I'm going to go ahead and, and have another music break. I'm going to have a little bit more music today just to, to break up all these little tidbits. So I'm going to cut to Hugh Laurie singing Baby Please Make a Change. That was Baby Please Make a Change by Hugh Laurie. And in case you're curious, no, that wasn't actually Hugh Laurie singing, but it is off of his album, and I assume he's the one who wrote the song. So the reason I'm playing all these songs about change, in case you're just joining me, is that I'm talking about the effects of climate change. So the effects we've already seen and some of the effects that scientists are projecting will be seen in the near future. And the next study that I want to talk about is one that looks at how climate change might cause animals to kind of aggregate in new places and to use new corridors when they're traveling between locations. And this is a topic that really I'd never even thought about before in the context of climate change. Um, so this was quite an interesting study to read a bit about over the weekend. And it makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Um, just as I was talking about how uh, the zooplankton might be moving kind of laterally in the ocean and go from a warmer spot to a cooler spot or vice versa uh, or even go up and down throughout the column in the water in order to find a temperature that's most comfortable to them. Um, so too could land animals do a similar sort of thing. So we know that animals tend to migrate already but often the reason that they're migrating is not associated with the weather. Uh, we tend to think of it as being associated with the weather because it happens in the spring uh, they've come back after the winter, and then they go away before the winter and the autumn. And so it makes it seem as though they're trying to avoid all that cold weather. But actually it's more closely related to the fact that, uh, for most of them anyway, that they need to go get food resources. And the, the really cold weather will kill off the things that they need to eat, or it might cover it up with snow and ice, and so they can't access it. And they go elsewhere because they need to get this food. Um, and so, actually, you might have a similar sort of thing happening on a more permanent basis if you have climate change affecting the plants that are growing and the insects that are associated with those plants and the insect-eating animals associated with those and so on and so on. So as the weather kind of alters all the different parts of the food web and, and pushes these things into new habitats, then organisms that need those products, uh, those resources, will relocate also in order to be where those resources are. And when they go through migration, so they'll probably still do their annual migration on top of that, they're going to be migrating from a new place to a new place, or they might be migrating using a different pathway. And that's going to be further complicated by the fact that there's a lot of human growth, and we have buildings and roads and all sorts of things that could get in the way of these animals as they move, either permanently or temporarily. And so there was a group of researchers that were interested in thinking, you know, what's going to happen when we have all these unsuitable habitats all of a sudden because of climate change, and you've therefore got all these animals that are trying to relocate. So you can have um, all sorts of, of interactions between animals uh, and each other, animals and habitats, animals and human features and habitats, and they wanted to take a, kind of a spatial look at this and plot out all the areas where organisms might live, the best places where the organisms might go as temperatures change, and look at the routes in between these two things and see whether these routes are going to encounter structures that are in the way. And this, of course, is going to be quite useful in a conservation uh, context and also a management context because you might need to protect areas that already have kind of natural corridors that allow for movement between spots, or you might need to, to have corridors that are already there expanded to accommodate more animals, or if you've got certain places that don't have any corridors at all, you might need to think about installing them. And if it's much easier to think about doing this now rather than after, after the fact, 
when you've already got problems emerging, when you've already got more buildings being installed. And that's actually an issue that I mentioned a couple weeks ago when I was talking about those raccoon dogs in, uh, in Asia, because you know they, they are now finding that those raccoon dogs need more area than they have, and it's very hard now in really built up areas in Japan to go in and install places for these raccoon dogs to live. But if they'd known about this, a couple decades ago, they could have prevented some buildings, they could have protected certain areas of parkland, and they would have been golden now. So this is kind of the whole idea behind this study, is, is to kind of get an idea of things before they come to a tipping point and make life easier in the future. So the researchers were looking at, uh, again, the, all of the Western Hemisphere. So this is a bit focused today, I guess, on, on North America. That's just a coincidence that happens to be where all this research was done. And these guys were interested in both North America and South America because obviously you do have quite a lot of flow of organisms between these two places. And in particular, you've got a lot of birds, for example, that will migrate from North America to the South and then back again um, before and after the winter. And so they looked at 10 different projections of what the climate is potentially thought to be like, and then they kind of averaged um, across all, all of the results. So they looked at these projections and used those projections to predict where species would go in order to find a habitat that is most like where they're currently living or, or where they would preferentially live. And then they used those predictions in order to create the single average of where organisms are most likely to be moving. And then they took this information and overlaid it on um, information about cities, where there are buildings, where there are big massive cities where there are roadways, where there is agriculture, because um, obviously having animals wandering through your agricultural fields might not be such a good thing. They also looked at other landscape areas that are potentially more natural, so things like giant lakes or big mountain ridges that would naturally have an, inhib an inhibitory effect on whether or not organisms can move. And basically their whole analysis was uh, founded on principles from electricity, which is quite interesting. So they've taken information from a very different field and applied it to animal movements. And if you know anything about electricity, which to be honest, I don't really, um, but the basic idea is that electricity will find the path of least resistance when it's traveling across a circuit board. And so the idea here is that the current, the electrical current, is actually the, the animals that are moving from one area to another. And the resistance would be the presence of landscape barriers. So you can kind of create these algorithms for treating the animals like electricity and these landscape barriers um, like resistance. And then you can say, right, so then where are the places, where are the pathways that these animals would find to get from point A to point B while avoiding all of these things that are in their way? And this allowed the researchers then to identify not just the pathways that are are likely to act as thoroughfares, but also kind of, you know, the spots that will be easiest. Because an animal might have several choices of, of habitat where it might want to go, but it will choose the one that's probably easiest to get to or closest. So they could look at kind of both of these things at the same time. And in particular, they identified areas that were going to likely act as thoroughfares and have suddenly this huge influx of animals over time. And one of the really important ones was southeastern Brazil and the whole Amazon basin. And these areas could have up to 17 times the average level of traffic that they kind of predicted across the whole region over the same time scale. So that's, you know, obviously quite a lot more animals than normal. And that would be okay. I mean, normally you think of the Amazon as being quite diverse, and so you think, well, of course animals can kind of go live in those habitats. But the problem is that even though there are lots of animals there now, it's also extremely built up, and there's very little room for animals to maneuver around. And so if organisms start to go down in that direction, they're going to encounter a lot of cities, a lot of roadways. Uh, they're going to be just a, a lot of problems. Not only could they become roadkill, um, they might start to infest buildings, or they might you know, start to go somewhere and then suddenly find that it's a big city, so there, there are no resources to eat, there's no food, there's no water, there's no shelter, so they die out. So there are lots of problems that they might encounter if indeed that is where they go, and that's the path that they try to, uh, to follow. Another important area was the southeastern portion of the U.S., which could have up to two and a half times more traffic, uh, again, than, than is typically predicted across this whole area, and the Great Lakes region as well. And uh, the Great Lakes region, if you know about U.S. geography, you'll know that that's kind of um, the, the northern bit of the U.S., the southern bit of Canada, where the two countries meet. 
And this, tip, this type of area where you've got kind of high northern latitudes, that's kind of the beginning of the high northern latitudes, this is going to be a particularly active researchers think because they're going to be a huge influx of animals into this region. So animals uh, that would like this kind of you know, moderate sort of temperature that you can find in these areas, that, that's where they're going to have to go because as the southern portion of the U.S. becomes hotter and hotter, the animals are going to shift up and they're going to be shifting up most likely into that kind of Great Lakes region which is now a bit cooler than the rest of the area. So it was quite an interesting study. Obviously it's still a bit hypothetical. We haven't gotten to those temperatures quite yet. We haven't seen all these landscape changes quite yet. So we don't know whether this is actually going to be the case or not, whether this scenario is actually going to come to be. But it's quite an interesting idea to think that maybe we could take a look at these regions now and build some of these structures or make some plans for how we're going to accommodate these organisms and potentially save some wildlife in the process and make it a bit easier as climate change continues. And the researchers of this study also go on to point out that, you know, managers do need to consider that climate change is not something that happens all by itself, and also human land use is not something that happens all by itself. These are two things that are going to interact in quite a complicated way. So this is kind of a similar message to what um, the authors of that Atlantic cod zooplankton study were mentioning. You know, nothing is simple out in nature. Ecology is quite a complex thing, and you can't really look at any one of these variables in isolation and really get the full picture. So they're advocating for considering all of this stuff at once in order to make sure that uh, you can, you know, really prepare for whatever scenario is thrown at you as things change out in the wild. And they also caution that you know, even if you're thinking about something like birds that, that can fly and can easily go from one place to another, even if that's your only worry, you should still think about these sorts of issues because these species will need little stepping stones to get them through the harshest habitats, whether that's harsh because of weather or harsh because of uh, human influence in those areas. So even if you're just thinking about little species that are highly mobile, this is still going to be a really important issue as the climate continues to change and these animals are pushed more and more into human areas. That was Change the Sheep by one of my very favorite artists, Kathleen Edwards. And the next item that I want to discuss today in my quest to update you guys about all the latest news about the effects or potential effects of climate change is the potential for climate change to cause perma sorry, I can't speak, permafrost to thaw. And this is quite an interesting study, actually, uh, that researchers conducted in Siberia. And they used, they took advantage of the fact that when you've got water, that will occasionally thaw and then refreeze. When it does this, when it's in liquid form, it will trickle down through uh, cracks in, in the ground and it will find its way into caves. And when it does that, it will pick up minerals along the way and form what we call stalactites and stalagmites. And these are kind of, together, these are known as um, cave deposits or speleothems. And so these researchers went to Siberia, which is a, a great region uh, for studying permafrost. There is a lot of it. And they looked at the speleothems that had been created there in caves. And in particular, they were looking at the Ledyanaya uh, Linskaya cave. That's really fun to say. Uh, in eastern Iberia. Sorry, Siberia. Not in Spain. They were in Siberia. And they were looking at uh, the, the formations that had been made there and trying to date them. So if you know how old certain things are, then you know when they were formed, and then if you can think about uh, what the climate was like at those times, then you can kind of get a feeling for what sorts of climate conditions were needed to cause the permafrost to thaw so that it would make these things. And then you can get an idea of what will happen as we maybe approach those types of climatic conditions as we undergo climate change. And the reason that these things are formed in the caves is that, as I said, they, they, the water will pick up minerals as they seep through the ground and then they'll drip down into the caves. And the age, or the age, the air in the cave will cause the minerals to precipitate out of the water, which means that those solid things will um, emerge from the water and no longer be dissolved in it. And so that they will aggregate together and create these things that hang from the ceiling 
uh, the stalactites or the things that will sit on the ground and kind of poke upwards, and those are the stalagmites. And basically, the cave temperature, on average, whatever the cave temperature is, is more or less equal to the average annual air temperature outdoors. And this is something uh, not studied in, in this particular study. This is known, I guess, amongst the people that study these sorts of things, the geologists. And so they're able to just kind of get an idea, not of you know, the annual fluctuations within an area, but on, on average, what is it like? What is the air temperature per year in this general area? And how does that relate to the other conditions that are happening you know, in the caves or with whatever thing they want to study in that region? So you can age the speleothems then by, by looking at the minerals and by looking at deposits that are, are within them. And you can compare that, as I said, to other climate data. And so basically, when you've got uh, temperatures of zero degrees or below, you're not going to have any speleothems forming because the water will be frozen, obviously. And so the researchers were looking to see how far off um, and what, what kind of fluctuations are you looking for? How extreme do the temperatures need to be before you have that permafrost beginning to melt? And then, and then how much melting is happening? Because you could have different layers uh, of different sizes and get an idea of just how much of that permafrost is actually becoming water. So it's not just whether or not it was thawing, but how, you know, to what extent was it thawing? And when they looked at these speleothems in eastern Siberia, they found that there were two really clear periods of deposition. So well, the first of these was about a million years ago, and the second was about 400,000 years ago. So these were two times when you do have a lot of melting of the permafrost, uh, causing these things to grow in the cave. And at both of these periods, they were able to look at climate data that had been collected elsewhere, so probably looking at, uh, for example, cores of things that had been taken from the Arctic or the Antarctic. And so they knew from previous studies from other databases of weather that global temperatures at these times had increased by about one and a half degrees Celsius above uh, the pre-industrial level. And this was kind of a, a tipping point for permafrost. And right now we've got current levels of, of uh, temperature on the globe that are about 0.7 degrees above pre-industrial levels. So basically we're about halfway to that tipping point of where all the permafrost will start to melt. And a lot of climate models are suggesting that actually one and a half degrees is something that we will achieve in the somewhat near future. So within 10 to 30 years we could actually get up to that one and a half degree increase. And that means that a lot of this permafrost that we currently have in actual frost form could start to melt and this could have serious implications for the ecosystem. And this is really important because permafrost covers a vast amount of space. So if you look up in the northern hemisphere, you'll find um, massive areas that are covered by permafrost. And it's not so much you know, the idea of this ice that's becoming water that's a real issue. What's really important is the fact that permafrost contains other things within it and can have uh, repercussions further on down the ecological line. So for example, there are approximately 17,000 gigatons of organic carbon that are currently locked up by that permafrost. And as soon as the frost starts to melt, it's going to release all of that carbon. And that can, uh, and also not just, um, not just in, you know, carbon form, specifically we're looking at carbon dioxide and methane. And if you know much about climate change, you know that already these are two things that have contributed to the effects that we're already seeing today. And so if you're releasing more of these, then you're going to even further the, the climate change effects. And it's going to have this horrible feed, feedback loop. Um, so you're going to have more carbon dioxide and more methane, and therefore more warming, and therefore more uh, melting of the permafrost. And so that's just going to accelerate everything until you've lost all of your permafrost and potentially have a whole lot of greenhouse warming. So clearly, this is something that could have really significant effects on not just that local ecosystem there in Siberia, but on the world in general. So this is a, a really important thing to keep our eyes on uh, and to figure out if there's some way that we can prevent that further, you know, 0.8 of a degree of warming that would get us to that tipping point and to see if maybe we can come up with some methods of, of counteracting these effects so that even if this does start to happen, we can find a way to sink that carbon as it's being released by the permafrost. Now I am running out of time. I only have about five minutes left, so I'll just really quickly go over uh, a re very recent study, actually. I think it just came out a couple days ago about minimizing the carbon footprint. And 
The reason the study is so interesting, and I can really quickly zip through it, is the fact that it was trying to figure out um, whether it's better to use planes or trains or automobiles whenever you are traveling. This is something that a lot of people have looked at, but what they tend to look at is on average, is it better to do a plane or a train or an automobile? They don't say, you know, what if each person can make different decisions based on certain kind of local factors, and all of those individual decisions can be added up in some way. You know, are there some circumstances in which it's better to drive than take public transport? Or is it better to maybe take a plane than to uh, take the train? And so this is quite an interesting thing because it does recognize the fact that each one of us can make all these decisions that have a lot of serious implications and can actually do quite a lot of good. And it's a really timely thing, obviously, because it's uh, summertime now. We've got a lot of people taking holiday trips, so you can keep this in mind as you go about your daily business. Uh, and what these guys were looking at or, or taking into consideration was the fact that different vehicles will have uh, different occupancy levels. They'll have different efficiencies. Uh, some things will release greenhouse gases and aerosols in, in different amounts or different types of these things, and that will go on to have kind of a different effect on the, the climate. Uh, air travel is kind of interesting because it creates contrails, which obviously these other forms of transportation don't do, and it also promotes the formation of cirrus clouds, and all of this can have a big impact by kind of creating ozone and, and affecting the climate over shorter periods of time than than these other methods of transportation that are associated with carbon dioxide. So all of this research was thinking about all these little tiny things uh, that can contribute and balancing those out to say, you know, is it always the same or can sometimes one thing be better than another? And what they found was that air travel is generally pretty bad, so we already kind of knew that. Uh, if you can avoid it at all, that's great, and if you can um, you know, if you can think about minimizing the number of trips that you need to take that involve air travel, that's even better. But when you're choosing between train or car, it really can depend on how you use the devices. So if you're traveling alone in a large car, that can actually be just as bad for the environment as flying. But if you carpool with lots of people in a small car, that can be just as good as taking a train. So, for example, if you take a thousand kilometer uh, trip in a car, that could yield 250 kilograms of carbon dioxide. But if you take a train trip or you do a, a carpooling where you've got maybe two or three other people with you, that could yield as little as 50 kilograms of carbon dioxide per traveler or something like uh, 150 to 200 kilograms total across the whole vehicle. So that's still less than that individual trip that you were doing in a car. But it shows that also there are some conditions in which a train trip would be equal to carpooling. So if you're kind of bending yourself uh, you know, backwards or tying yourself in knots in order to always take the train and, and not do the car, then you can think about carpooling as a good alternative and that might be a lot more flexible for you and potentially more comfortable as well. And so the researchers of this were saying, you know, it is really important to think about, uh, you know, the options that each person has for each different circumstance and just make sure you're adapting your decisions for each of those scenarios and not just taking one piece of advice and applying it all of the time. And these authors also were hoping that we could work on fuel efficiency and low carbon fuels to kind of maybe balance it out a bit better to make all of these things um, better than they are currently. And with that kind of positive note, I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap up. Uh, won't have time for a whole song, I don't think, but we can go ahead and give it a start. So I will finish off today with Jimmy, Buff Jimmy Buffett sorry, singing Changes in Latitudes, Changes in Attitudes, which will be perfect for any of you guys that might be heading off to go to the beach uh, this weekend. So on that note, I will close for today and talk to you next week.